Hey guys, this is Josh here from Trillium Wild Edibles. I'm out here doing a little bit of hiking today and a little bit of mushroom hunting. Uh, so I thought I'd bring all of you guys along with me for a quick little walk in the woods. And uh, maybe we'll see some awesome mushrooms. Like these awesome pear-shaped puffballs that we can see right here on this log right here in front of us. These are pear-shaped puffballs. And uh, they are related to the giant puffballs that you would normally find in your lawn or in other similar areas. They're also related to the gem studded puffball. Believe it or not, these things actually are edible. And they are quite delicious if you can get to them before they start to spore out. These are a little too old as we can see. The cap is sunken in a little bit. And we can see these little holes. Like if I push this, you can see that little cloud. And that's all the spores right there. Um, at this stage, these are not edible. These are not safe to eat at all at this stage because they have spored out. And this uh, spore that comes out is, believe it or not, toxic. It's okay if you get a little bit of it. You're probably going to get some anyways. But one of the ways that people used to use this, uh, these spores, is they would take these to stop nosebleeds. They would take these pear-shaped puffballs and put the hole right under their nostril and they would squeeze it. And all that dust, all that spores, all those spores would come up inside of the nose to help stop a nosebleed. But it actually causes a respiratory illness and a respiratory disease. So do not do that. Do not do that. I repeat, do not inhale these spores. Though it is quite fun whenever you're out there to just go poke. But some of the interesting things about the pear-shaped puffball is they grow in large numbers like this versus the gem-studded puffball usually will grow solitary or in maybe groups of two or three. And the good thing about these pear-shaped puffballs growing this way is that it's actually pretty easy to collect a lot of them for food if you get them in the right time of year. Another really cool thing is we can see this log that they're growing on right now. These pear-shaped puffballs will grow on this log every year until it can no longer support them. So if you're walking out in the woods and you see these, make sure you come back the next year or even a little bit later in the fruiting season and you might even find some more depending on the weather. So I thought I would show you guys these real quick. So let's continue our walk and uh, see what else we find out here today. Well, I literally just turned around and uh, here we can see some more. We can see this one's already opened up. This one uh, feels like it's getting a little soft. This one feels all right. I don't know, I might, uh, I might take one of these uh, and cut it open in half to see. But if we look over here, we can see some more of these pear-shaped puffballs growing out of this log. But you simply want to take the pear-shaped puffball off of the log and then cut it in half. So you can see the inside. And we can see here the inside of this is brownish green. So this one is bad. This is not edible any longer. You wanna make sure that the inside is white. Another good reason for cutting them in half is to see if there's a little bit of a stem developing on the inside because they can resemble um, some other button mushrooms. Generally though, those button mushrooms that they're gonna look like don't grow on logs. But sometimes if a log is buried and uh, you can't really see that there's a log there, it can look like it's coming out of the soil. So it's a good idea to always cut your puffballs in half before you plan on consuming them or even picking all of the ones that are there. So this guy, I'm just going to set back down. But because that one is spored out and by the texture of them uh, and these little dark spots that we see in the center starting here, these are too old to pick. They are a bit fresher than the ones we just looked at. Uh, about a second or so ago but keep that in mind with these puffballs so a couple of quick little tips if you're looking for the gem studded puffball or the pear shaped puffball this time of year a really good tip to keep in mind is to look for mature growth oak forests you want old growth oak forests because there's usually not a lot of stuff on the ground a lot of plants growing a lot of different brambles and briars and things the forest uh, floor is normally rather cleared out and it's just a bunch of dead leaves some leaves and sticks um, bare soil and moss those are the types of places that you really want to look for and this type of environment that you can see behind me is perfect for it you know right here we can see if we look out that the forest floor is actually pretty cleared off it's uh, very open very easy walking and it's also a lot easier to see what type of mushrooms that you're looking for also in these environments you can find boletes growing here in this type of environment as well. It is bolete season right now, so maybe I'll find some, maybe I won't. 
Some other mushrooms you're probably going to find are going to be, for example, you might find fall oysters if you find a tulip poplar tree that's in the area. Um, you might also find amanitas mushrooms of various types. So this area is a really good area to look for. Also, with these big oak trees around, it's possible to find hen of the woods or maitake mushrooms. So I'm just continuing walking down this little, uh, little old logging road here. Um, there's a trail that this connects to, I don't know, probably about 300 feet from where I'm at right now. And all I'm doing is I'm just kind of walking slow and just kind of keeping my eyes out um, for any big oak trees, any big old oak trees. Uh, that's one of the best things to look for this time of year. Now also, I should mention that yes, acorns are dropping right now. This is usually what I call the first flush of acorns. And normally your first flush of acorns that are dropping are not full. Um, they're usually duds, as, as I like to call them. There's usually not a lot of nut meat inside of them. Sometimes they're actually empty or they're already infested with uh, the weevils, acorn weevils, uh, way too early. So it's best, if you are looking for acorns, it's best to wait until after the first hard frost or a little bit later in the year, around towards the beginning to middle of November is usually a better time to get your acorns because you're getting the second flush, which is usually the most fruitful and usually has the most nut meat inside of all of the acorns. So I thought I would mention that really quick while I'm out here just uh, kind of taking a nice little stroll. Once I get up here, there's a trail that runs this way, runs perpendicular to this logging road, and I'm gonna hang a left and right in through that area also goes into another good old, uh, o old growth oak forest. So that's where I'm headed right now. Here we go, look at this nice little uh, stick bug we got here on this big oak leaf here. Beautiful oak leaves, very, very large. As you can see by my hand being directly underneath it. These would make excellent toilet paper because of their size, but I wanna show you this cute little guy. I don't know if cute's the proper term, but I think he's cute. All right, little buddy, you enjoy your day. Now, right here on the ground, you guys can see some of these acorns that are dropping. And you can see just how small these are. Now, that's not a bad thing that they're so small. But if you feel it, you can tell they're really, really light. Um, that's because there's really not much nut meat inside of these. And that's because these are the first flush. Some of these are obviously way older than this here. Um, but if we look around, you know, like right here, for example, we can see these very fresh caps falling off. So we know that the first flush of acorns is falling right now. So if we give it a couple more weeks, we'll probably be getting some of the really, really good acorns coming on. So I'm just kind of continuing on right now, uh, taking a nice, good, easy stroll. Not going too fast. You don't want to go too fast this time of year, especially if you're looking for mushrooms that are growing along the ground because they blend in very, very, very well. And you can walk right past dozens of them and never even notice it. Old fallen down tree here. Got some rocks stuck in its roots. That's always pretty cool to see. But up here shortly, this trail is going to start dropping down into a hill and it's going to be uh, running up against a creek. So uh, there should be a little more moist of an area. It's actually surprisingly quite dry up here on this ridge top. Um, probably a lot of these oaks just sucking up all the water and everything. Um, really, really awesome day out though. But once we get down uh, this trail and down this hill some, we should hopefully find some other cool mushrooms. This patch of grass is growing like my hair. All right, so just give you guys an idea of how hard these things can be to find or how well they blend in. I want to see if you guys know where the mushroom is in this frame. By turning it upside down, looking at the pores, and by looking at the top, this looks to be a species of bolete. Uh, obviously very, very old, not one that you want to eat. One of the ways we can tell it's really old is just by obviously looking at the underside and how dingy brown that is, especially with all those little brown spots everywhere. This guy is a little too old. But also, if we look at the underside of these pores here, we can see just how big each one of these tubes are. 
Whenever you're going for a polypore mushroom, you want to make sure that the pores are nice and tight. You don't want them to be too open like this. And you definitely don't want the underside of your bolites to be this dingy and stained. This guy is really old, but a good looking mushroom nonetheless, or at least it was at one point. And then right over here, just, I don't know, maybe six, seven inches from that, we can see this old coral fungus growing right here. These things are absolutely cool. They're called coral fungus because they look just like coral. Really cool. These things can get quite large too. These things can get up to several pounds um, if you're lucky and you find a good one at the right time of year. So I thought I would show you guys that awesome little mushroom. And then right over here, just a couple more feet from that coral fungus and that bolete that we just found, we can see this really old coral fungus. This thing's dry and actually pokey. It actually feels more like a coral than it does uh, actual fungus. Well, well, well. I am really glad I did not turn around yet. I actually kind of thought about it. Here we can see a wonderful looking maitake or hen of the woods mushroom. And it's around this big oak tree right here, this old oak tree. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six. There are six of these maitakes here growing along the edge of this oak tree at the base. See, this is a really, really good, see, this is the type of oak tree you wanna look for, guys. Absolutely amazing find. These are looking really, really good. And right there is the highly poisonous Amanitas mushroom. Do not eat that guy. I know it looks like a yellow version of the Mario mushroom, but trust me, it will not give you superpowers. So whenever you are looking at your maitakes, before you harvest them, there's a couple things that you should keep in mind. One, you want to see if they have started sporing out. If we look right here, we can see this mushroom has already spored out. If we feel the top of it, it feels rather tough and almost wood-like. So this guy is a little too old. Another thing you want to check is you want to check the undersides. Because as we can see here, there are spots of mold growing there on these undersides. We can see these big tube-like structures, the pores, if you will. We can see those are wide and opened up. And we can see all that mold on the inside there. So this tells me, so that tells me that this would not be a good specimen to pick, though it is a good sign because this tree, I know, is a good producer of maitake mushrooms. And it will produce these for years to come until it cannot produce them any longer. So I'm going to take a look at these others around me here to see if any of them might be good. Of course, I do think that they probably are a little too old, though. Yeah, this would have been a really good mushroom to find about a week or so ago. This thing would have been amazing. I mean, look, just look how big this guy is. I mean, this thing's about the size of a basketball. And this is common with your uh, hen of the woods or maitake mushrooms. But this one has also started sporing out and is also starting to mold. It's getting really, really tough and woody at the top of it here. Feels really tough. But that tells me, this tells me where I need to look. And I need to look out for this tree next time I'm out mushroom hunting. For my takis, I need to come to this tree. Because it'll produce these for years to come. Well, I only got about 40 or 50 feet from that tree. And I found another really good maitake mushroom. Now the maitakes can vary a lot in their appearance and the shape of these caps. But this growth form is the main thing to look for growing near an oak tree. You also want to check the undersides to see if it has pores. And if we look here on the underside of this one, we can see just how tight these pores are. Now I've investigated the underside of it. This guy looks pretty good. Um, I might actually pick this guy. But right over here, we can see an old one. This one is a little old. It looks like there's another one right over there. Okay, when I touch this one, it's a little soggy. Um, it feels right, it feels all right. I don't see any signs of it sporing out. It looks old, a lot older because of that black tinging that it has. And right here, we can see this guy, this other little one. So this tells me between these that I found, this area, this forest is a really good spot to be for the maitakes. These trees are producing really, really well right now. 
If we look at the underside, we can see just how tight these pores are. And I'm not seeing any mold on this at all. So this tells me this is a really fresh mushroom. Right here is another good sign of a really old maitake or hen of the woods. This orange tinging that we can see along the outside of this indicates, well, I should say is another indicator that this guy is way too old to be picking or consuming. You can also feel it's just very tough and woody feeling. It's not, it's got a little flex to it, but not much. If we look inside, we can see the flesh isn't perfectly white and we can see these pores. We can see just how big these pores are. So this guy is really old. It's not an edible specimen. But again, it's another good indicator that this tree and all of these trees out here that I'm seeing right now are just really, really, really good producers of maitakes. I've been looking for another good maitake spot for a while um, because a few years ago, my maitake area um, was logged. So they cut down those oak trees. So I, was, I haven't been able to get any for quite a few years. So to harvest your maitakes, all you need to do is cut them at the base above the ground level and then cut off any spots that you can see. Like on this one, I picked off the spots that were kind of bad. But if we look really close here, look how nice and white and tight all that is. This is a very beautiful, beautiful specimen of maitake or hen of the woods right now. This thing is absolutely gorgeous. It's pretty good size, about the size of a soccer ball almost. It weighs, I'd say probably about three, maybe four pounds. This is a really, really good size mushroom. And like with any other mushroom, after you collect your maitake, just put it in a mesh bag, and that, may, that way any spores that are in it uh, will fly around and hopefully create more maitakes. This also allows the mushroom to breathe some, sorry about that. Um, this also allows the mushroom to breathe a lot so that way it doesn't get soggy on us whenever we're transporting it home. It's one of the reasons you never want to use plastic bags for mushrooms is because they will get soggy because mushrooms have a lot of moisture in them, especially these polypores. These guys are basically like gigantic sponges. So make sure you keep that in mind. I don't know if you guys can see this, but I've got my mesh bag tied to one of the straps on my backpack. So that way I don't have to hold it in my hand and that way it's real easy walking. I can just kind of walk around and I don't have to worry about this guy falling out while I'm walking around. So I thought I'd show you guys this neat little uh, trick that I like to do whenever I do get mushrooms. Something else I wanted to mention about the maitake, because of how big they can get in size, it's a good idea to dry or freeze them. I like to just simply freeze them fresh. All you do is you pick away the fronds, wash them up really good, pat them dry, and then just put them in freezer bags right into the freezer. Then that way they will stay good for several years, or you can go through the process of drying them out. I prefer though just simply freezing them because then I can just throw them right into a hot pan and they're ready to eat. So I thought I would mention that really, really quick while I'm on my way back to my car.